Hello, everybody. <laughs> Happy Friday. I'm so excited. This is the second roundtable I've had today with Stephanie and Catherine. This morning, we got to sit down with Tamara. It was very early for us over here in America. Now we're at a more decent hour. We've got the awesome Cindy, who is one of my friends here in, in Atlanta, not just on the internet, but also in real life. <laughs> Although I do consider YouTube to be real life as well. But um, we have a really, really exciting show today. And it's interesting because yesterday, Catherine and I, most people know that we had a uh, episode together where we kind of were talking about how we were feeling a little bit down in the dumps and just kind of having like a little bit of pity parties and you know that the the hardness of growth and and I realized something as I was getting ready and it's interesting because today we're going to be talking a lot about Kali and I know I had a subscriber ask us to talk more about this in this dragon energy and the divine feminine the divine mother and I will say after the episode I did with you yesterday Catherine and then sitting down and doing the round table this morning with a bunch of powerful women and then being here again with powerful women right before I signed on to zoom to, to do this with you guys, I had a, re a renewed sense of energy. And I just thought that was so cool. You know, my sister, when she was in college, she used to say, I'm here to meet my bridesmaids, not my husband. Now she ended up meeting her husband in wow. college, but she had this goal that she was going to meet her bridesmaids that she that it was important that she had really strong women around her all the time. And I think that is the renewed sense of, of, um, positivity I feel now is that I've gotten to, to you know, in t less than 24 hours, I've gotten, I've been able to spend time with really fierce, powerful women who are again, like the bridesmaids, you know, like it's uh, women, you know, we're coming into this new age where, where women have always been competitive with each other to get that man. But now that divine feminine is coming back into the play, we're able to have these really strong female connections and so i have to thank you guys for that because it's made me feel so much better to have these girl chats with a bunch of really strong badass women so mm -hmm. thank you so much and i took i after we got off with tomorrow i took a bar class online and it kicked my ass but i was just loving it and you know the female teacher was so powerful i might still a little shaky my hair is still a little wet but uh but you know so i just have to thank you guys and i thought how appropriate we're going to be talking about kali and um it's interesting so i have this deck of tarot cards the Jungian tarot cards and the high or the empress yeah. card i don't know if you guys can see this in the back there's a dragon and kali is often associated with this like fierce dragon energy and i thought how appropriate for what we're walking into in this new timeline where the divine feminine is being brought back into uh, the playing field. Um, and so I'm actually, I want to actually pass the ball over to Cindy um, because she's kind of doing these courses to bring up that divine feminine and people. And this is something Cindy, you've kind of been doing a lot in this life, like really honing in, of course, Everybody knows Cindy on this channel. She's um, of Peruvian descent. You come from a line of women that were very strong and very magical. Um, and so I think that's in your, in your DNA as well. Well, as we do as well, but I think our ancestors, we got a little bit more separated from, from their, uh, their witchiness and their, their cool, magical ways, you know? So, um, and I apologize guys if the sound goes in and out. We're having a little bit of issues, but we're just working with what we got. So, so Cindy, do you want to, you want to take the ball with this and start us off and introduce who Kali actually is? Yes. The one thing I, I feel like I need to say, though, because I get this question a lot as well, especially when you're talking about some more of these fierce energies like Kali or dragon. And, you know, they come in with like fangs and claws and, and fire is uh, um, especially for those who might uh, come from a conservative background. Yeah, there you see. Are you showing the images yeah, of Yeah, yeah. That, that people often get concerned and they're like, well, are you, like, how are you know, how do you know that this is coming from this, the highest good? You know, how, how do you know that you're not actually chan channeling demons or, mm -hmm. some, or some kind of lower vibration? Right. And I can say that, yeah, because, you know, you see images of Colleen. She has like, she wears a, 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 a waistband heads. of arms. Yeah, <laughs> and heads. And a necklace of skulls. And, you know, she's, she comes out with bangs and her, uh, her tongue sticking out. And it's a frightful image. And, and the reason that like the dragons and the collies, they come in so fierce is because they are devourers. 
but devourers of the ego and aspects of you that are no longer serving you. And they also come in when, it, um, let, let's say you're going through uh, a time in your life where you know there's change, that change is coming. Mm -hmm. But you're having a hard time making the transition to that change. And they'll, like the, the dragon and the Kali energy will come in and they will literally just tear things apart. And at first it, feel, it feels hard and it feels difficult because you're going through these processes of ego deaths and they're not always the most pleasant experience. So, you know, sometimes when you see the Kali or, or, or dragon energy, there's a fear that comes up, but the fear is usually from the ego saying, oh shit, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's about to happen here? But when they come in, while they're, they're going through this, this process of, of destruction and, and, and it might feel even, you know, Oh, wrathful, but it's done from a place of unconditional love and from your highest good. And when you're going through these processes, like the divine mother, you know, Kali, she's a divine mother. She's, she's coming to you, even though she looks fierce and with fangs and with arms and with skulls, she's also holding you and nurturing you while you're going through those transitions and, and just telling you, just, just be like, can you, can you just be with it? Just be, don't, yeah. don't fight me. The more you fight me, the worse it's going to get. Yeah. But um, they're not, yeah. But, but this idea that, you know, my gosh, is this, is this demonic or, or what am I getting myself into here? And I can tell you from doing energy work, I know what demonic energy actually feels like because I've actually pulled that off of people. And that's a, it's a very different feeling than, than Kali or Dragon. But I just wanted to put that out there to, you know, just for, for some people who this is new to and you see like fangs and claws and fire and you get a little like, oh, my gosh, you know, that's frightening. Um, the, those particular energies, yes, they can be frightening, but they're, they're usually frightening to, um, to the part of you that's resisting change. Yeah. Well, I want to point out they in, they're going to come in bringing a big change into your life. You're yeah. more likely you're going to go through this destruction, this destructive process. And, and I'll point out too, I was just telling this to Stephanie. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions about the Hindu faith is that people believe it is polytheistic and it's not. The Hindu faith is actually monotheistic. They have the, the, the tri head like Christianity. We have father, son, Holy ghost. They have Shiva, Vishnu, Brahman. That's their tri head. And I, I asked, uh, a, a, a man in India once, like, what's the difference between Christianity and Hinduism? He goes, oh, Christians believe God came to earth one time. Hindus believe God came to earth many times. Um, and I just kind of laughed at that. I was like, well, that's very humbling. You know, <laughs> like, like we, we, he's got to keep coming back. And one thing too, you know, we've been talking a lot about like Jesus or Yahshua and the Magdalene. The Mary Magdalene, that's we've talked a lot about, Cindy, that's coming back into the forefront now, that it's not just about, you know, down with the patriarchy. It's finding that balance between the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And that's one thing you see in the Hindu faith as well, is that these avatars of God all have a masculine and a feminine. Kali has her divine masculine, and but they're both equally powerful. Wow. And something too with a lot of these Hindu deities is that they, a lot of time their skin is blue with Kali. Sometimes she's depicted with blacks, very dark skin. Um, and I've been taught that that is because they come in and they drink the poison off of you. So they take that from you, which is not serving you. And that's why their skin changes colors. You see there, cause they're, they're taking that, that, and like you said, that very nurturing, loving, loving way. And yes, I know I've had episodes, Kali, Kali seasons in my life where I think we all have, where all of a sudden out of the blue, everything just goes topsy turvy mm -hmm. and you don't know what's going on. You feel like you've lost everything, but then out of it emerges a new path, a new path because she is the bearer of death, but she's also the bearer of life which is what Ganesh does as well. There's a lot of similarities between Ganesh and, um, and Kali, but Ganesh is a little bit more mild, I would say <laughs> a little bit more mild in his approach to it. But, um, but yeah, 
Yeah, and uh, another way that I've I've heard it explained to me too about the different the, the deities and such and the pantheon, the, the Hindu pantheon, is that they're pieces and aspects of the bigger God. Mm -hmm. Yep. That our our ancestors, the people who came up with the, the idea of these deities, it was God, the idea of, of God is so big that it was too hard to wrap your, your human mind around the bigness of God. So they they took they took the idea of God, he, she, whatever you want to call it, the creator, the creatrix, however, however you envision God for you, and they divided his energies into more bite-sized pieces. So, you know, Kali is the sphere's feminine in energy of death and destruction, but that's also an aspect of God. You know, yeah. like Ganesha, he's the remover of the obstacles. You know, the the I, I love Ganesha. But that's also an aspect of God, mm -hmm. you know, Lakshmi. And, uh, you know, she's an aspect of the divine feminine. It's all about luxury and abundance and uh, all those and prosperity. But that's also an aspect of God, you know. So yeah. it's like taking uh, taking this this huge idea of God that's too big for our minds to wrap around and putting it into smaller pieces for us to be able to comprehend. And uh, I, I just made a video yesterday with a friend of mine, and we're, you know, we talk about the mystics axiom, which basically it says as above, so below. And what these deities represent, no matter what uh, pantheon they come from, whether it's the Hindu pantheon or the Greek pantheon or the Roman pantheon, is it that yes, they're bite-sized nuggets of God, uh, God itself, but they're also aspects and representations of you. Yes. So that when it, you forget something about yourself, yesterday we, we, were, we were talking about, about the, the aspect of Jupiter and Zeus, who uh, represents the aspect of God, which is all about expansion and abundance. But, you know, we sometimes we contract and we come into our smallness, we forget how expansive and abundant we are. And then, you know, we might work with an essence like, like Jupiter, let's say, to help us remember our, abund our abundance and expansion. Yes. So that's the way that, uh, that the traditions work with these different, these different deities. You know, so Kali it reminds, is here to, to remind you that you are, you are both a, a, a magnificent creator, creatrix who can, you know, create from the dark womb, from, from the place where everything comes from, like from the original womb, like you have the power to go into that space and you also have the power to, to destroy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you know, not to destroy. I mean, you do have the power to destroy in a, in a negative way, but you have the power to, to destroy and, and create new lives and to like to create new timelines. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like that power, that Kali essence, that power, it's, it's within you. I mean, she, she comes and she helps you out, but it's, it's pulling from you. Yeah. Like, and isn't that like what's ready. happening right now though? We talked about this morning with Tamara that the opposite of war isn't peace, it's creation. And there has to be destruction before something can be rebuilt. We talked about that mm -hmm. this morning. Um, that's, would y'all say we're in like a Kali season as humanity yeah. right now? We have been for several years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've only got to look at the way nature works in terms of, you know, nature will have fires that seemingly destroy something and then everything comes back renewed and stronger from that. And I was just looking, you know, my daughter cleared one of our areas of our garden and it's just incredible how quickly it's recolonated and how strong the new colony of plants has come back. Um, what is the significance, Cindy, of the tongue, the sticking the tongue out? I don't know that one. It's, you know, I think I used to know that, but I can't remember that anymore. But it's it's uh, because of everything. If you look at her, the the symbol of her, like she's she has her foot standing on uh, this little beast or this little. You know, sometimes yes, it's a person, and that's like the ego. Mm, that's yeah. like, you know, there's a lot of deities that are standing on something and that's like them standing on the ego. It's like the death of the ego. Like, yes, you know, I've got you. The tongue apart, I'd have to um, I'd have to look it up. I, I can't remember that exactly, but but I'm pretty sure like with all of those, there's a deep meaning to every, every yes. part of it. 
The reason Everything. I was asking is because do you remember a couple of years ago, a lot of the pop stars and things, there was this whole thing where everyone would take their picture with their tongue out. And I'm just wondering if it's related in some way. Um, there was a phase where for about a year, everyone's selfies of the younger people were with their tongue, tongue out. out. Yeah, you know, I remember my Gene Simmons style. from her. Was <laughs> yeah. <he> was in. <laughs> no, I'll have to research that, though, because that's yeah. a great question. But that's I'm yeah, I like how you I'm sure it means something. I like how you pointed out the details because all the Hindu deities, like one of my favorite things to do in India is to go to these really old um Hindu temples. Uh that is funny because India is like it's like a country of chaos, but there's like order in the chaos and there's like a, a relaxation and and they have these old temples that some of them are abandoned, and you go in and like look at the uh the structures. And the, the sh how they've really taken so much time to to like chisel these beautiful deities and these beautiful characters on the wall. And there's just so much detail. Like a lot, like with Ganesh, for example, a lot of people think Ganesh is the elephant god, but only his head is elephant. You know, his his the story is uh, the original head of the body of the boy was cut off by Shiva. And so Shiva had to go and get a head to put back on, and he put an elephant head on. And yeah, so Parvati was very upset because uh, yeah. Ganesha yeah. Was, was the son, a creation of Parvati or Shakti. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when she found out that Shiva cut off her son's head, man, she got pissed off. And mm -hmm. so Shiva was like, ooh, woman, pissed <laughs> off. <laughs> Let's fix it. Hell has no fury <laughs> like a woman born. The first animal. <laughs> And put the head of that on Ganesha. On Ganesh. And I you love that offense. The beautiful thing about Ganesh is you see with the head. So the body is the body of technically of a human being. You can see that with, with the uh, feet. Um, but with Ganesh, the beautiful thing people talk about how is how he's got two ears and a small, a very big ears and a small mouth. So he's there to listen. Um, and he's one of the most famous of all the uh, Hindu Hindu deities, uh, one of my favorite deities. And we see that a lot with because Stephanie, you were asking me earlier before we started filming if these were like mythological or if they're based in any type of like true story. And when I first started uh, going to India and really started to understand the Hindu faith, I perceived them as being fully mythological. But at this point, because we have all these this idea of like off worlders and we know that we see all this stuff in the Bible that was taken out. I'm starting to wonder if they aren't off worlders, if they aren't some some mm. reality of something. Um, and I know like one of my favorite stories of Han Hanuman from the Ramayana and Hanuman is the monkey god. Um, and in the Ramayana, Ra is the uh, is the. Um, how do you spell Hanuman? Here we go. Um, he is the, uh, Ra is the avatar of God. And Ra marries Sita. Well, Sita, so if Ra is God, Sita is the representation of the soul. Well, the ten-headed demon, demon Ravana ends up kidnapping Sita and bringing Sita to uh, Sri Lanka, the island off of the coast of India. And Ra is distraught because he's missing his wife, Sita. Well, that's God missing the connection to our soul. That, 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 on a, that, because the ego, Ravana, again, that demon represents the ego. And so he hires Hanuman, this monkey god, who is the son of Vishnu, which the wind, the breath, to be able to go and rescue Sita. So he has to defeat uh, Ravana, who is this 10 headed demon that every time you cut a head off, a new one grows back. It's the ego. So his mission through the breath, through the courage of breathing, through the courage of action is to return the soul Sita back to God. And we are Hanuman. We are Hanuman and we are Sita. And we have to take that courage. Um, that's a fierce looking Hanuman right there. Um, to, uh, to, to go. And there's a very famous line that Hanuman says. Um, and he says, uh, when I forget who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you. And it makes me I, when I think about that that line. It's just when I when I when I uh, when I forget who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you. And and, um, the, as and, and the aspect of Hanuman's story that I think goes very well with what you were talking about at the beginning, Bryce, where you were you were saying how you were kind of feeling down in the dumps, but then you were gathering with everyone, and you were you know you felt much better. 
Well, there was a point where at the beginning of the story, right, that Hanuman, he, he has superpowers, but he didn't know he had superpowers. He, he completely yeah. forgot that he had superpowers. That was part of his punishment for trying to eat the sun. Yep. He thought the yep. sun was a mango. And yep. he completely forgot that he had the, he was a, he's a, he was a, a, a part God because he's the son of Vishnu. And uh, what made him remember were his friends. His friends told him, it was the bear, for, the bear one, I can't remember what his name is, but the bear said to him, he was like, hey, don't you remember that you're the son of Vishnu, that you have superpowers? And just from that, he remembered uh, in all his glory who he was. Yeah. And so your friends, your, your people, your tribe, they're here like you forget that you have your 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 wisdom your your power your superpowers but your your friends your tribe they're they're here to help you remember yeah it's a beautiful story we have a big uh, hanuman on the wall at our shala here in atlanta um it's it's hanuman's a beautiful story i have actually a little hanuman in my car that uh hangs off of my uh my rear view mirror because yeah i, I remember that story of him like that courage to remember because he Hanuman has the ability to drop, jump from the banks of India all the way to Sri Lanka. He's the only one that's able to defeat Ravana to take the soul back to God. And you're right. That's showing it. As our friend Janine says, we are magical beings. We just don't know. I mean, they, 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 they want to tell us that we have 97% junk DNA, but are we Hanuman? Is that junk DNA? No. And when you were, you were asking whether they're mythological, you know, maybe in a sense they are mythological, but your, your energy, like your prayers, human prayer and energy has, a, has power to it. Mm -hmm. And when it, you, you put your energy into something, your prayer into, let's say, Hanuman or Ganesha or, you know, you, you know what, whoever, whatever you're, you're, you're feeling like you need to, to pray to at the time, whether it's Magdalene, Mother Mary, whether it's, it's a Jesus, it's a Christ consciousness, whatever it is, that their, their essence, their energy grows and extends with, with your prayer and your belief in it. That is, yeah. that is how powerful our belief is, though. That is how powerful our prayer and, and it's, 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 it is our most highest superpower <laughs> is yeah. your imagination and your belief that when you pray into something with with all your faith that that the energy of that thing actually expands and grows so ganesha is alive and well because he has so many uh so many you know especially in india so many people who pray to him as this kali kali is alive and well oh yeah where you know some of the ones who have lost <laughs> lost, lost their rank lost their lost their uh prayer you know that they they actually lose their strength with um with I asked, uh, I asked the hindu man in india once so how many how many times has god come back how many avatars are there and he goes oh too many <laughs> yeah Ladies, um, I will be right back. My my son is at the door and he won't go. So I'm gonna go. That's talk fine. To him that's first. fine. That's fine. Yes. Um, no, you know, oh, too many. I love I love the Indian culture. They're so funny. They're so funny about life. But um, you know, yeah, it's in it, it's funny because I know Cindy, we've talked about this a lot because we both run courses and one of my favorite uh most impactful books I've ever read and continue to restudy periodically is the Bhagavad Gita. And of course, that's Krishna is is the avatar in the bhagavad gita and you talked about this idea of of god the or the creator the source being so huge that we we have to kind of break it down into bite-sized pieces because our we just can't fathom something first our of all our, yeah our, our body we can't even imagine something that never had a beginning or an end that just always has been like that what you know that it's just always been because we live in a in a, a natural cycle of birth life death um, and in the Bhagavad Gita, we have, there's a scene, and for those who've never read the Bhagavad Gita, it's a, a small little story in a bigger book, but it's about this kid, Arjuna, who um, has to go to battle. Uh, he's a warrior. He has to go to battle for this land in India. And he has to, he's standing on the, the whole story is him having this like literal come to Jesus moment, but it's a come to Krishna, Krishna moment where he's standing on the, the battlefield and he's facing off against his family, his friends, his teacher, people that he he's really loved in his life. And now he has to go to actual war against them. 
And he's having this like moment of panic where he doesn't want to do it. And so Krishna who was with him, who was the avatar has these conversations with him. And Krishna is a very, you know, the Christ, the Krishna is where the Christ comes. this idea. He's a very loving, he's very similar to the Jesus from the Bible. Like there's a very loving aspect. He's not, you know, they all have their different ways of maneuvering um, within their environment and their different bite-sized pieces of God. And Krishna, first of all, tells Arjuna, like Arjuna is trying to get out of this. Like he don't want to do this. And Arjuna, Krishna's kind of like, um, toughen up buttercup. You're a warrior. This is your dharma, which is kind of what a lot of us are dealing with right now. We're having to go up against and we're losing friends. We're losing. It's almost like this toughen up buttercup. Like this is your, this is your dharma. And then Arjuna begs Krishna to show him the full extent of who he is, the full extent of God. And Krishna's like, bro, you don't want to do that. I'm telling you, bro, not, not going to be good for you. But Arjuna is like begging him to show him. And so he's like, all right, I warned you, you know, you can't handle the truth. And he, he uh, let, allows himself to kind of break out of his body into that avatar to show his full extent. And Arjuna is just can't even look like he's just in so much pain to actually try to see the full scope of what God actually is. And so then Krishna has to come back into his Krishna body. He's like, told you so, you know, like, um, but that also, that also forges his belief because until that point, Arjuna doubted the whole yeah. entire time. He was, he was still like, you know, just like how we doubt, like how you doubt, you know, when, when you have the obstacles that, that, that get in your way and you're like, man, you know, am I doing the right thing? And no, you know, I don't think that this is the right thing. And, um, you know, all the self doubt that, that comes in and, yeah. Uh, you know, Arjuna had a lot of that doubt, but it wasn't until that moment where his faith came, kicked in and, and he surrendered at that point when, when he saw the full expression of God and said, you know what, I am going to do what you tell me to do because now I see. Yeah. My, it's, it's all about the perp, you know, our perception. And when we go through like these poly seasons or these difficult situations, you're your your perception shifts and there's a um a Clarissa Pincola Estes. I don't know if y'all read her book Women Who Run with the Wolves, but it's one of my one of my favorites. If you're talking about if you want to you know enhance or grow or, or understand woman, primal instinct and all this stuff, dragon type, you know, feeling wolf, that wolf feeling is she talks about the skull light. And it's the it's you being able to see through the clear lens of perception, like, but, but when you're seeing things through the full light, it's not pretty. Like you, you, that means you take off your rose covered uh, glasses, kind of yeah. like how Arjuna saw he, he, you know, that was the school light, the, the perception of seeing everything. And when we go through like the processes that you're talking through, when it, you see, like when you see clearly at first, it's just so very unpleasant. You know, it can be to see the truth is not always that pretty, but it's the truth that you need to see to gain your discernment and and for your your, your instincts, for your true instinct, primal instinct to kick in, your school light must kick in. Yeah. You know, and, <clears throat> and we've gone through that. <laughs> we've gone through that big time. I mean, we were we were talking this morning, we were like, well, was it? <laughs> you know, seeing the reality of the situation. I think that's what we've all been through this. And I've I've heard people say, and I've said this before too like even just the crumbling of our perceptions in this timeline of what we thought was real and what isn't real. And we were laughing this morning about how we don't even know like how close continents are to each other because we're doubting everything we've been taught now, how that, that facade is, is falling. But then you look at people who, who are not at that point yet to, to even entertain an idea like that. And that, that idea, I know we talk about the red pill a lot, but there's also this idea of the black pill that when you go through the dark night of the soul, when you have to face certain truths that totally blow your perception of reality out of the water. Um, and it can cause that, you, it's that hard truth, as you were saying, like that you have to face and you have to acknowledge and you have to be in that, that sense of almost mourning um, in order to break through, which again goes back to the Kali energy and the dragon energy. And we've, we've heard Janine speak a lot about the dragon. We've heard uh, Ashley speak a lot about the dragon. You see dragons, right, Cindy, when you were yes. working Yes, oh my goodness. When I was, I, when I was working, Working with it, uh, it came in really strongly when I was working with Mother Mary Mary Magdalene, which was really strange because I wouldn't have ever associated dragon energy with them before. But it, it was this idea that we were talking about is the fierceness of unconditional love. And see, Mary, um, 
both Mary Magdalene and Mother Mary, in my opinion, this is my opinion, that their power has been, was diluted, mm-hmm. like extremely diluted to, and, and, and then that also carried over into just women in general, where we were diluted to like the optimal divine feminine, or I mean, I don't think it was divine, but it was maybe what was considered it at the time was more like soft, and nurturing and is always the martyr yeah. and you know always giving back and and, and, and can't really have anything for for herself no give, that, give, this give, idea give, that, give. The, that the feminine was more more demure in there simply to serve in in a more subjugated uh subjugated way yeah and the and and even mother mary and mary magdalene were portrayed that way you know mary magdalene was always like crying and uh, uh she was a prostitute and all this stuff you know in other words her 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 essence was very much um diluted as was mother mary and what i came to figure out from the dragon coming in with them was like no we are actually very very fierce and this is the part of the sacred feminine i think that's that's really coming out right now which is why the dragon energy is coming in to so many people not just me but it's been happening to a lot of women and just the time i mean because it's funny when energies come in they don't just come into one person no. you'll start you'll start hearing lots of people talking about it at once that means that that like it like that energy is coming in in full force and the the, the dragon aspect of the female energy is to bring back that sense of no you know we're we're fear we, we're the mama bear mm-hmm. i mean think of like even mother mary what she had to go through to one birth the savior like she had to birth him through and the, to watch him die and to watch him suffer and to be there for him through all those different stages that is a dragon that's not some just like like boohoo mama you know that's yeah. a dragon and then mary magdalene who who stood next to him mm-hmm in the same light in the same power she stood next to him in ministry you know that is a dragon that's the dragon female energy that that's wanting to to come in it's like it's time for for women to understand it, it's okay for you to step in in your power in a fierce way not in yeah. just like a martyr way and i always have to be giving like it's been in lilith mm-hmm. you know lilith is a big energy that's been working with me for many years and she was, and she's like uh, uh, Adam's first wife, right? In her story, and she she got kicked out. Of, she got kicked out of Eden because she wanted to be on top. Damn it! And Adam was like, "No, man, you can't be on top." And they kicked her out of 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 Eden. And you know, anyways, I love her story. Well, isn't that <laughs> the Book of Esther too, where um, I think it's the Book of Esther where um, the the king she marries had a wife before esther but he like divorced that wife kicked her out because she wouldn't submit to him mm-hmm. like he would like summon her to the bed and she was like no i gotta wash my hair and he was like get out of my kingdom and then that like she was painted as this like bad person because she wouldn't submit whereas <laughs> esther submitted and so it's interesting to see the um i think it was esther or maybe yeah where it's it's interesting to see how these strong women have been i mean you were talking to, talking about methuselah the other day in, in class too with the snakes in the hair and you know her story and how she was just totally wronged and was totally just demonized well if you um, look at Medusa's story she was uh, um did we talk about this already i can't remember where i'll talk about what but anyway it's like medusa's story where she was uh, um the, uh uh, an apprentice of, I think it was, it was Demeter or Aphrodite. I can't remember which one. It was Aphrodite, Demeter. Dina, one or, yeah. One yeah. of those higher ones. I can't remember which one. And uh, she beautiful. Medusa was a beautiful, beautiful goddess who was just in love with Demeter or Aphrodite, or which, whichever one it was. I can't remember. And was her servant and, you know, just absolutely loved her. Well, Poseidon was, uh, having, was having an affair with uh, Aphrodite, Demeter, whichever one it was. And Poseidon saw the beauty of Medusa and came in and violated her. And uh, then uh, Demeter, Aphrodite, I need to look it up, <clears throat> got like jealous and turned her into the the ward that he is that she is with the snake heads and, or with the snake hairs and with demonized. And she got you know put in into caves in a cave. 
and men were sent there to, uh, you know, to try to kill her and everything. And I mean, and her, she, her, her story just had a terrible ending, you know, and, and whenever men, the only thing she could do was turn them into stone. So she turned them into stone and then, you know, Perseus comes and cuts off her head at the end. And, you know, her, her story doesn't have like a happy ending, but she is like the essence of sacred rage. Mm-hmm. Like, which Mary Magdalene talks about, right? The sacred, mm-hmm. the, the wisdom of the wrathful person, like having that wisdom within rage and anger. Yeah, I love yeah. Medusa. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, yesterday in America, we kind of, I don't know if we spoke about this morning with a, but we just had a Josh Duggar um, who was yesterday convicted of um, some pretty awful stuff we can't talk about on YouTube but you guys know what we're talking about. And I've done a lot of deep dives into the IVLP, which is a um, very, very, very conservative fundamentalist group uh, led by Bill Gothard here in the United States. And the role of women in these like super, super, super conservative fundamentalist groups is basically, you're not really even a human. You're kind of just a vessel for the man and you have to submit, like they don't believe in marital R-A-P-E. They don't, you know, you have to be completely subservient. And this guy, that's his wife. Like, you know, I've been thinking, I've, my empathy, people like get mad at her because she's still married to him, but she's totally brainwashed. But I've been thinking a lot about with Kali in her life, like her husband just got found guilty of uh, CP. So you guys know what that is with, with young, young, young people. And um, now she's probably going to get like what, 20 years maybe in federal prison. And how that this is such a Kali moment for her because she's been so uh, brainwashed and led to believe that everything about who she is as a person through this very toxic theology comes through him. And now he's been, and there's been many opportunities where he's done things where she should have left a long time ago. But of course, and the only reason why I know that all this stuff guys, for people who are not in America is that they have a reality show. So they are pretty famous here in America. Um, and now he's been forced away from her into federal prison. Uh, and, and I can't help but like be so, I know she's at the depths of despair right now because she's lost who she believes is the only person that can really give her life, which is her husband. But now that Kali energy is there for her to empower her to walk away, to give her the power to stand on her own two feet. And this is an extreme example of religious A-B-U-S-E, um, an extreme example, but we see that in a lot of like through the age of Pisces of how women were taught to be demure. Women were taught to be submissive. I remember when I was a little girl, we would go over to my, my mom's parents passed away when I was relatively young, but my dad's parents, we'd like go over to their houses, uh, their house on some Sundays and have like dinner. And my mom, before my parents got divorced, would get really mad at my dad afterwards. She'd always get mad at him because she would be like, Lee, your mom, you literally boss her around. We're all sitting at the dinner table. You like get her to get up and go get you stuff all the time. And she does it, but you're a f- fully grown man. You can get up and get your own damn things. Like let her sit and eat. But we've been trained. And my grandmother was a badass. Like she meditated and she believed in reincarnation. But, but we've been trained to treat women. They're the mother that has to give everything for their children, give everything for their families, everything, even when their kids are grown, my grandmother's getting up, getting everything, not even eating herself. And this, this paradigm shift is, ha- is, is, is totally happening right now. And we're seeing how, and again, it's not to diminish the patriarch. We need men. We need divine masculine as well, but we're finding that balance now between the divine feminine and the divine masculine where they can work in equal parts to each other and um and it's i think it's incredible and i think you're right it's like it's a collective moving forward you're seeing this with so many people are experiencing the same type of um of energies coming into their lives and um and that's such a beautiful thing yeah and you know the the when I was working, so I was working with Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, and soon after that, I started working with uh, Quan Yin, and the, the dragon that was present <clears throat> suddenly shifted. It sh- but it was it was a dragon nonetheless, but it was a, more of like a white, pearlescent, 
more of a of an Asian looking type dragon. The dragon that came in with Mother Mary Mary Magdalene were Game of Thrones dragons. When people watched that, but they were like, "Yes." Well, I was like, "Oh my!" Um, but it shifted with Quan Yin, but it was still a dragon, <clears throat> and it was interesting because. I've always, I was never really that attracted to working with Kuan Yin that much just because she seemed more mellow, right? She's the, she's the goddess of compassion. And I was always attracted to like Kali and Lilith and Medusa and all these, you know, like all these, oh, all these more, uh, more fierce ones. Well, you know, Kuan Yin is the goddess of compassion. I thought, well, you know, she's soft. Yeah, that, that's what they look like. It, that, it was the Game of Thrones dragon. It was like that kind of a dragon. But anyways, um, Quan Yin came in with her idea of compassion, but the drag that the dragon aspect of compassion and of Quan Yin is to cultivate true compassion from the heart. You have it's forged in suffering. Yeah, you know it's forged in your own suffering. It's it's forged from realizing that. Wow, you know, there, there's, there's really a lot of yucky stuff that's going on there right now. And, and, and it's not running from the suffering. You don't, you don't yeah. turn your back on, on the suffering. You lean into it. Mm -hmm. And in that leaning in, it breaks open your heart. You know, yeah. it, it, it like adds a total dimension to your heart when you start to allow in the pain and the suffering that that you've gone through, that other people have gone through. And that's something we usually try to avoid, right? We usually, like, we think suffering, like, mm, we turn our backs on it because we feel like it's too much for our heart to hold. But one of the things that I think we're coming into in this new earth as we're evolving as a human being is how much our heart can hold. Yeah. And, we, and you know, the idea of, like, the Grinch who has this little tiny heart and it expands out beyond the box in the in the movie our hearts are, are needing to be the same thing that they're um the the container of your heart is so much bigger than what we allow it to be you know sometimes we think oh you know the heart it's loving but it's a it's a it's a depth of love that also comes from a willingness to look at deep suffering and pain and that's the dragon aspect of that as well that is how your heart grows. We were talking about that yesterday, Catherine. Um, yeah, I, it's really fascinating because I know so little about this. So I'm just loving just sitting here absorbing it. But I don't know why this just keeps coming up for me over the last couple of weeks is it's not shutting off him. But I'm wondering why we're so focused on the suffering and that it has to be through suffering that we learn and grow a lot of the time. And I'm wondering whether when we move into the age of Aquarius that we can move past that and learn through other ways, because yes, that's one way we can learn. But for example, you know, Joe Dispenza talks about, you don't have to wait until you've got some terrible disease to change your lifestyle happens. It's one way of learning and evolving but I do sometimes feel we're so focused on that as a way of evolving. Do, are we actually attracting that in? And, and I'm not saying I completely agree with you, Cindy. It's so important that we don't shut out suffering and turn our back on it because we all do go through that. But I just feel, I don't know, that the, the focus is so much on it. And yet we can learn and evolve through other ways as well. I would agree. I mean, I think you can. I think the um, it, it's it's just like what you said, Catherine. That you you don't turn you don't turn your back on it, but you don't need to invite any more suffering in your yeah, life. I think it's, it's it's the relationship. The way I see it, it's the relationship that we have with it. Um, and the, the uh, what I was talking about, Kuan Yin, and the 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 suffering that we do face transmuting it into something more beautiful like compassion that's the alchemy part right it's like transmuting it into alchemy but no you don't need to have suffering in your life all the time that would be just absolutely miserable like kali seasons in your life they should be few and far between that should not be your whole entire life you know they just kind of happen when they need to happen because we're stubborn because we can't yes. see but you know i think that there are plenty of people in in life that don't need that that you know they don't need to have um holly seasons like they're here 
to just be pure, beautiful, love, light, and, and share that. I think that, that people are here in different parts. Like, I, the reason I focus on it is because it's kind of what I do. Like, yeah. that's what I help people with. Like, I'm a shadow worker, so that's what I do. So I tend to talk about it more <laughs> than an average person. But not everybody is a shadowy person. I mean, there are some people probably like you, Catherine, like, you're just like, I just want to, I just want to love, you know, I just want to expand. I just want to, I just want to, you know, do this. And I just want to shine more of that. And yeah, I mean, if that's what you feel like your Dharma, like that's what you want to do. And, and you're, you're not, you're not attracted to that other part, then yeah. I mean, go your route, like do so how the love work. You know what I mean? Like do that. Yeah, I think it was so helpful to sort of say that it's really helpful to know that people, when they're going through the Cali time, that that's nothing to be ashamed of. It's to be embraced and you're going to learn and grow and move forward from that. So I think that's so, so positive because I, I don't know anyone that hasn't been through a Cali time. <laughs> Quite honestly, I've I think certainly- a lot of us are going through a Kali time right now. Yeah, so. Into mine. so I can see it's really, really um, positive. I just, um, and I suppose perhaps it's a lot of what I've heard people talking about over the last few weeks because of where we're at at the moment um, is just they're sort of very focused on, well, it has to be this hard. It has to be this way. But I just do feel that moving forward, we're moving forward into a different way of learning and we don't have to all go there you know, quite so often or, or as humanity we don't have to go there and if we're if we're more aware of us as more people talk about it and bring awareness to it the less you have to actually go there mm-hmm. yeah to focus on the beautiful things for sure because there's a lot of there's so much beauty in the world that's happening right now simultaneously like there's there's a lot of death and destruction and all this stuff but there's so much beauty if there wasn't beauty in the world we it would we would be in an apocalypse for sure Mm -hmm. but it's the beauty in the people and the love and the kindness and the people who who can see things uh, uh, probably like you, Catherine. It's like you're ready. Like you see the light. You're 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 ready to to see the light, and you're ready to move into to that new golden age. And like you see it, and you feel it, right? And there's a lot of um, a lot of that that we need for sure. You know, a lot of hey, look, there's another side to this. There is a lot of beauty and a lot of love and a lot of good people. Like not everybody is bad. There's just, there's a lot of good people in the world too. And um, yeah, let's let's focus on that. That's as such well. an important point, isn't it? Because with the whatever we want to call it, the awareness, the awakening we've all go- gone through. By the very nature of learning about it, um, I mean, certainly, you know, I've I've come across so many things over the last couple of years that I didn't even know existed, you know, were just be completely not in my reality at all. And I suppose because we've been going through and talking about that, like you were saying the other day, Bryce, that you don't need to talk about the little people as much anymore because you've been through that curve that learning curve whilst of course so many people haven't been through that yet and that's where they're going to need so much of that support isn't it Cindy that you offer because when you do realize I mean a lot of people are blissfully ignorant and and just they can't understand what's been happening because it's just not in their consciousness that I don't want to even call them people, really. I don't know what to call them. But, you know, that psychopaths could act in this way because for most normal people, that's beyond their comprehension, that level of evil. Yeah. 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 And you- and I was just going to say one thing, just in response to, to what you were saying, Catherine. Yes, I mean, uh, the people, I mean, not just me, but people mean uh, you, people like you in the world who are who's the light on the other side who says, okay, here's... Here's like the other, there's like all this, you know, sometimes we got to go through all this mucky stuff, but look, here's the beauty that's on the other side. Come here. So like, you're the light that directs, come here, you know, come here. This is, this is where, where you want to go. You know, there's some people that guide through the muck 
and they're the, they're the ones that are on the other side that are saying, hey, there's, there's something better. Mm. There's something more beautiful here. That's what Mr. T keeps saying throughout the whole of, of, of his, uh, his term was what the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The yeah. best is yet to come. Um, and I know I, even if we look at like the law of one, which we, I speak about a lot because it makes a lot of sense as to what's happening now combined with the book of revelation and this idea of timeline shifting again, uh, as, as I said yesterday, you know, consciously we hear people talk about, we're moving from third density to fifth dens density or excuse me, third dimension, third dimension to fifth dimension. That's a conscious approach, but the physicality of our bodies and our earth are moving from third density to fourth density. And what I understand from the theories behind the law of one is that in third density, um, bodies and in third density planets you are a planet of polarization so you have the dark and the light you have the suffering and the joy but moving into fourth density positive a fourth density planet can't be polarized it either has to be positive or negative i don't know what that looks like because i we only know the the polarity side of it so when we move into 4d will we we might not need the suffering anymore that might not be a part of the patterning of that density i don't know you know so that is and the this beauty, this peace, this joy, it's you know the the truth that has always been the truth from the beginning of time mm -hmm. is that it's all available to you right now. Yeah. You don't have to wait for it. It is all available to you right now. Every single bit of it is available to you right now. We, we're just veiled. That's what happens. We just get veiled. We forget. We get confused, which is why these collies and these dragons, they come in and they're like, you know, wait a minute, you, you've just forgotten who you are. But in order for you to remember, we need to destroy the veils of limitations that you put upon yourself that you've chosen to believe. When that is destroyed, then you'll be able to see that it's been with you all along. That blind thing that, um, oh, sorry, Bryce, go okay. ahead. Oh, no, no. Um, so, so something that just came to me too is actually came to me a couple weeks ago, but more or less now that we're talking about this is a lot of us divine feminine too. I feel like the divine is stripping away the old to allow us to take a step forward first so that we can usher in others. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the old stuff, a lot of the old relationships, a lot of the old habits, a lot of the old belief system has had to be, it's like an onion and you take away the layers of the onion and the beauty is in the middle. Well, not really in an onion. <laughs> That's a bad analogy, <laughs> but um, you know where I'm going with that. It's like you have all these layers and layers of programming, of relationships, of all these different things. And in order for us to be healers in this next world, whatever it looks like, we kind of have to, I think us awakened people have one foot in that other world already without even really realizing it in order to bring in the next you know the usher in these other people who are still sleeping or might be a little bit sleeping and a little bit awake you know we're going to be the ones who i think form does that make sense like we're yeah. i'm trying to come you're, up with the correct wording no you're right too uh stephanie the things about the the healers and the teachers and why they often have to go through the chaos, it's because it's through, like, my chaos, the chaos that I have had to go through, I can recognize it in someone else. But when someone comes to see me, and they've got some shit going on, I can say, ah, you know, I get this. I understand this. I've, yes. I've been through this, and I've, I've helped lots of people go through this, and I can help you better. And that's one of the reasons for like teachers, like like teachers and healers, why it's not it's not always the, the mystics path is not always the most. I mean, it can be a pleasant path, but it's not. It, it usually comes with yeah. lots of ups and downs. Yep. It's so that you can understand the the descent, so that you can help people. When you go through your descent, you know, then you have to come up through your ascension. Mm -hmm. And you can navigate people through theirs. So you can, you understand the descent, you understand the feelings that are there and you can help navigate people up through, through the ascent because you went through it. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what I was alluding to. So yeah, it makes perfect sense. It that, you know, Sorry. Go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> no, I was just agreeing with you, both of you. That just makes such perfect <laughs> sense. And the thing is, 
that's the beauty of life is you don't all have to you you, you learn your lessons and then you help pass them on to others that mm -hmm. want to because you're, you're then constantly speeding up the process and making it smoother because not everyone has to go through the same day all the lessons that every healer's learned every coach has learned and everything they're then helping other people's to get through it a lot quicker and a lot easier hopefully each time they go through it which is just moving all of us in the direction that we want to a lot quicker and speeding up that whole process exactly yeah. not everyone has to go through it yeah I, mean, I, I agree with you on that 100 percent, Catherine. not everyone has to go through not everyone needs to go through it i had someone tell me once that every like every other life and i don't know if this is true or not interesting theory that every other life we live like what we call an active life and then a passive life then an active life and then a passive life and so when your soul contract is to live like an active life meaning you're gonna your soul's gonna grow a lot you're gonna go through a lot of crap in that life but then the next life you get to rest and things get to be easy you know and it's like um and, and we never uh Shrat said once my teacher in india said once in conference um he was talking about with the practice of yoga, how you practice yoga every seven lives. And what I took that to mean is that it takes seven lifetimes for the lessons learned in one lifetime to really settle into your psyche. So when we go through these battles, when we go through these like, you know, rites of passage, dark night of the soul, even though we learn a lot in this life, we have no idea the extent of what our consciousness is actually understanding in that moment beyond the mortal brain and so when you see it that way it, it even though it sucks when you're going through it that kali phase it it seems the gravity of what you've actually been given as an opportunity becomes so beautiful you know david greig used to say this is the, this is the golden ticket mm -hmm. this is the golden ticket even though it sucks right now you have the golden ticket you just don't realize it kind of like Hanuman you just don't realize it but you have this opportunity to to ignite something that other people might not ever have that opportunity to do in this life so I guess it's all about perspective isn't it my husband <laughs> is one of those people who don't need to go through a whole lot like like my husband he's just like this happy go lucky he didn't need all, he didn't need any of that and I um, just have to sit back and admire, and I'm so glad that he's my husband. <laughs> he's a <laughs> jolly guy. He always has a smile yeah. on his face. You need those. You need those anchors of just people who are who are just naturally that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. My husband. That's so funny, Cindy, because mine is exactly the same. My husband is so laid back. His horizontal. Mm -hmm. Nothing stresses him out doesn't take attention it doesn't care what anyone else thinks um not in a nasty way but just it's just not in his awareness he's just very happy um in his own world and, and he's completely oblivious of a lot of the stuff that we're all talking about so like, why would i put any of my attention on that i'm quite happy exactly. where i'm at and it's just lovely to see the different approaches it's just really fascinating isn't it to see and there is no right or wrong we're all here for our own lessons but you were saying about the perspective it's like you know i've got a twin sister and she loves roller coasters and i hate roller coasters and the age-old analogy, if you asked us to describe the physiological symptoms of what we're experiencing when we're standing in that queue, she'd be saying, oh, I'm so excited, I can't beget, wait to get on. And I'd be saying, I'm terrified, I don't want to get on. <laughs> How do you know you're terrified? Well, my heart rate's up, I'm sweating, I'm breathing faster. How do you know that you're excited? My heart rate's up, I'm breathing faster, I'm sweating. Same symptoms, different perspective. I'm telling yeah. myself I'm scared of it. She's telling herself... Uh, uh, conscious or subconscious level that she's excited and that's like life isn't it it's like the breath mm -hmm. you hold your breath when you're scared and when you're excited yes both times you're holding your breath it's funny uh cindy and i we've talked about ayahuasca before and i've i've never done ceremony but i know a lot of people who have and um it's not something i'm against i definitely would be interested in doing dieta at some point but um somebody i know did it did a ceremony and he you know, a lot of people go through that ceremony and come back completely changed um have just a completely different outlook on their uh on their life after they taking the plant medicine and he he said uh said, yeah, another yoga student who this is the whole concept of yoga too but he, he got it in an ayahuasca ceremony and he was like 
I realized that my happiness and my sadness are coming from the same place mm. and it's within my control. It makes so much sense. Mm. Yeah. Like even if you look at like childhoods, like for me, there are certain things about my childhood that bring such happiness to me. And then there's some things that bring complete opposite depression and anxiety or triggers. So, but it comes from the same source. It comes from the same source. Well, and you, and you're able and you, you know, it's like, I, I love what you said yesterday, Catherine, like I didn't break your heart. I broke your expectations. You know, like we have, we have patternings that, that have directed what, how we perceive certain actions, action, you know, people get all big, you know, that, that guy that called us all a witch, he tried to compare karma to the Kama Sutra, which are two totally different things, which is kind of laughable because one quick Google search will tell you the difference. You don't even have to go to DuckDuckGo. Um, all karma is, is cause and effect. That's all karma is. It's yeah. your work. We call it your work. It's your cause and your in effect. You know, if I, if I call someone a bad name, they're probably not going to like me. That's karma. That's cause and effect. That's science. It's as my, as David Greet used to say, that's the law. That's how it works. And so, and I know, uh, Cindy, you've always said, I'm just trying to live this life, not to build up any more karma, not to build up any more work. But when we look at karma, it, it's, it's neither bad nor good. We, we label it as bad or good, but it's just action and reaction. It's all it is. And so if you can learn how to react differently to the action, to perceive the action differently, you change the outcome of that energy that's been passed to you. Um, if that makes sense. So, and no, it's not the Kama Sutra. The Kama Sutra is something very, very different. <laughs> That's for your next show. That's funny. <laughs> yes, the next. That's why I'm for Jean Claude. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the next one. He'd be good at that one. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. I've never studied that. So <laughs> oh my god, it's hysterical. So, well, ladies, it's been an hour now. That was so fun. It can't be an hour already. Yeah, it is already. Oh. Yeah, this Crazy. is so fun. We should just, do this more often. I just thought that that explanation at the start. I was just absolutely fascinated by that i'd so love to know more about that cindy i really would it's just so lovely to see that it explained in such detail the different meanings behind these characters because i knew i mean i had to message bryce yesterday so and then nothing at kelly and and that was just the same thing <laughs> absolutely fascinating and i'm i'm almost quite blown away by all by the depth and how much there is to all of this so thank you yeah. so much for that thank you for having me yeah i mean the cultures are so rich with information yeah simply open open our our sites or our minds to it and not just think that one way is the the only way cultures are so rich and have so much so much to give I love, I, that's one thing I miss the most about uh, Mother India. Um, and as a Westerner, when you go to India, it's, um, you're going there to study, but literally it's the country that's your main teacher because you're having to deal with so much that you can't, it's so different <laughs> from the Western world, but being there and, and learning the details of this, these old, old, old systems of belief. And I know I was saying in class on Sunday, because I teach at Sunday Shala on Sundays, like even the different hand mudras that you see people doing, like every aspect of your hand within every joint is a different point of energy that represents these different deities or avatars that we talk about that you can press in and these pressure points to connect to that, that pathway of energy within you. Um, it's yeah, and all, each finger represents an element too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we do that. We, we end our practice and, and this, the, the, you see people do this a lot in the West, which is a, a bad symbol. It's not this. If you look at all the, all the structures, that mudra is this, it's the pads of the fingers together. My teacher in India gets very upset. If you do this, it's not this, it's this, it's the pads of the fingers. And that connects, that's the joining of God and man, like the painting of the, of Adam and, and God touching hands. It's that, that joining through that pathway, which then goes up the value of the arm. And um, it's just also beautiful. These, these, old, old, old faith are so um, just inside of you. It's, it's all about what you are and who you are. 
in relation it's like uh, we talked about krishna earlier when krishna was a baby in his human form he he was called govinda and there's a famous story where you know as as kids do they put things in their mouth and dogs they put things in their mouth and his mother saw him eating dirt. She went to open his mouth to pull the dirt out. And when she opened his mouth, she saw the whole universe inside of him. That's us. The whole universe is inside of us. I mean, Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. The kingdom of hell is inside of you. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want to be?